So who's my guest this week? It's Niall DeMarco. From America's top model to Oscar-nominated film producer, he's become an ambassador for deaf pride, taking on the hearing world on his own terms. He's fourth generation deaf, choosing not to communicate vocally, and has long challenged the notion that learning to sign can hinder the ability to speak English. His memoir, Deaf Utopia, is a love letter to American Sign Language, explaining why he doesn't think deafness needs fixing. You're going to hear why competing in America's Next Top Model was hell and why he's pretty annoyed with Will Smith. Did you see the slap? We're talking about Will Smith, of course, here. Oh, I did, in fact, see it all. I mean, I think everyone in the audience was quite confused initially. It seemed like a joke or like a scripted bit, but no. Soon as Will Smith started screaming, my interpreter let me know and everybody went quiet. And I thought, what are you doing stealing our spotlight? Come on, Will. Yeah, I was gonna say, that must have been, I mean, were you actually annoyed about that? Was anyone frustrated in the, the deaf community? Because it really was the thing. Yeah, certainly. It was, yeah, it was, my, it was my first thought. I felt like, you know, this is such a historic moment and it really felt like a moment for us. And I thought, at least let us have this one night. But, you know, it's very typical for hearing people to want to set on themselves <laughs> and ask us to just orbit them. <laughs> Niall DeMarco, welcome to the program. It's really good to have you on the show. And I should say, we'll be speaking to each other through an interpreter today. But what I wanted to start by asking you, right at the heart of your book, the title no less, is what would a deaf utopia look like to you? Good morning. I, a deaf utopia, I think for me, um, would certainly look like a place where we all have complete access, uh, which means a world inclusive of sign language, but also uh, with accessible features that make deaf people feel like we can really connect and belong on this planet. What does that mean? What, I suppose what I'm asking is what don't we have at the moment? Well, I'd say some of the things that we don't have um, just in general is uh, a lack of deaf culture awareness. So many people that I meet who are hearing and conversation often remind me that they don't know that deaf culture exists. They don't really realize that we have a community. And from their perspective, Deafness is a disability and couldn't possibly be inclusive of a culture, which in fact is not true. We have a language which gives rise to culture. I think essentially that really starts with a lack of awareness. You also mentioned there the need for sign to be better understood or better recognized. Are you talking about in a deaf utopia, everyone would be able to have some kind of literacy? Yeah, I mean, essentially, I would love that. Uh, you know, I, I think that's probably one of the biggest goals that we really have as a community. You know, sign language has incredible benefits for hearing people and for deaf people alike, right? In sign language, we can speak and communicate faster than in English. We can also talk through windows and underwater. How cool is that? <laughs> Yes, it really is. I hadn't thought about that at all. Um, but yeah, there, there, are, there are other things I'll come to from some of your stories about some of the benefits people may not have realised, not least having a party at home without your mum knowing because you could just shut the door and, and go for it. Uh, and I think some of those examples are, are amazing. <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, we call that hashtag deaf games. <laughs> You know, being from a deaf family is incredible, but it's also incredibly rare. And I think kids like me tend to abuse it. My mom being such a good sleeper was really helpful for us when we wanted to rage at four or five o'clock in the morning. I mean, you mentioned your family, your fourth generation deaf. W what did that mean growing up in your family with how you learned to communicate and, and the culture around you? Definitely. Being born to an entirely deaf family and having deaf parents meant that I had access to language day one. To be honest, I don't really remember first learning to sign, like many other people don't really remember their first words either. It's something that I wanted to hear your view on because we've just been through a pandemic. I mean, we're still in it in, in lots of ways. And people were having to homeschool. And then I imagine for those children, didn't have access to to the deaf schools and to their to their peers to the people that they were used to being with. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's a great point. It was a very large problem in the community. Deaf schools 
all over were faced with an entirely new issue of how they bring the exposure to the parents and how do they bring them in home? How do they provide access to language and continue exposing them to our culture and continue to give them not only exposure to their role models, but also the ability to socialize. Having to send those children home to a place where they couldn't practice sign was in many ways traumatic for so many kids out there. And an entirely new issue that we faced with the pandemic, you're absolutely right. I suppose the other thing as well, and I wonder if you had an experience of this, is everyone was wearing masks and, and a lot of people still are. Uh, was that difficult for you during the pandemic? Definitely, definitely. You know. For me, in everyday life, I depend on lip reading often, you know, and honestly, lip reading is certainly not the best way to communicate. If you look at any of the statistics, you see that even the best of lip readers can only catch about 30%. But suddenly with a mask, I was at zero. So all of the guesswork was gone. Of course, it was frustrating, but I think all of us really were in this together. Yes. Well, it's lovely to be able to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. Likewise. Well, Likewise. Happy to take those off. For sure. And it's nice to be able to see people's faces now. Yeah, exactly. And some of the real expressions. Um, I, I'm obviously minded of the fact that a lot of people really liked your face because you won America's Next Top Model. Uh, that's a that's something that we should bring up. But I, I wonder when, <laughs> <laughs> when going onto that program, were you thinking about how it was going to work that you don't talk uh, in, in the sense of how some people were going to then find it to communicate with you? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was honestly one of the first things that I considered. I remember when America's Next Top Model first reached out to me for the audition. I ignored it. You know, of course, any type of reality TV show and certainly a competition, I felt like wasn't going to be ready for a deaf person. I certainly had never seen one on TV before. But, you know, they reached out multiple times and finally I responded and said, are you really ready for a deaf contestant in the first place? They said yes. So I started the journey, but of course it was tough. I did have an interpreter on set, but only 10% of the time, meaning 90% of the time I was lacking the ability to really communicate fully. I don't think they really understood the accessibility needs that really came along with the deaf contestant, but also how to accommodate. And so much of it just comes with, you know, reality TV shows, the, you know, psychological warfare, the mind games, you know, the causing drama to make better TV. And I certainly get that perspective, but I survived through four months of it. And would I do it again? Uh, no, I'd rather not walk through hell. <laughs> not walk through hell? Why hell? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, four months, I mean, imagine for four months, you could only use, say, spoken English for 10% of the time. I was texting back and forth with everybody else, which is incredibly limited. I mean, think about how fast mm. we can text, right? It doesn't really carry like a, like a conversation. So to only be able to use your language about 10% of the time, you know, your language that gives you not only dignity, but who you are, it's, you know, your self-confidence, your pride and your ability to express. I think that the minute you start to think about that, you would feel incredibly isolated if that had been your experience. And yet you could also, you, you yeah. could also be forgiven to think being a, a model is perhaps a, a good profession in the sense of at least you don't have to talk when you're doing the modeling part. Right, right, exactly. And to be honest with you, it was an incredibly isolating experience. But I think in the end, I really was planning for a result. I was looking forward to the end and not only to win for myself, but also to win for the community and to be able to elevate the amount of awareness of our culture and our community, which I think really was more important. You know, honestly, modeling as a deaf person there's a lot of benefits, right? I come from a very visual culture where we study body language. So it's definitely a different level being able to study a photographer and what they're looking for and also to be able to emulate the, the poses. I mean, body language is really what we're experts in. Yeah, you, <laughs> I'm now just thinking about how I'm sitting, what I'm giving off to you here. I'm, I'm gonna think this through a bit more, but it's one of those things that must be, it must be a bit of a, a superpower. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. and. If you take a look at any of the articles out there about deaf people's peripheral vision, you'll actually see that studies have been done to show that it's enhanced, it's widened. We actually see more and we take more of the world in than hearing people. So yeah, we're superheroes. <laughs> you'll take that, I'm sure. Um, and it's uh, it's something, you know, again, to think about a different way of seeing the world 
and actually reading the world while you're in it. You also, of course, are known for dancing with the stars and music. It seems, uh, again, if you haven't thought about deaf, the deaf world, the deaf culture, is an incredibly important part of, of being in the world. And it's that experience, I understand, of feeling the beat. Well, I mean, personally, do I feel, if, I could, if you're asking if I could feel the beat on set, I'll be honest, I couldn't hear or feel anything. So our rehearsals were pretty interesting in that we had to practice using other systems. We would often use uh, larger studios that were quite wide open. And the system that Peta and I developed was counting. It was just simple math. But we also shared a cue system that we developed. For example, uh, if Peta tapped me, that was uh, say to begin the routine. A hand squeeze would mean that we were going to switch a uh, specific formation or footwork. Scratch on my back might have meant that I was late. So to the audience at home, of course, nobody noticed. But if you go back and watch some of the reruns, you'll be able to catch some of those cues. But for some people, they do talk about being able to feel some of the beat, but you couldn't feel anything. Right. It really just depends on where you are. So my twin brother, actually, who is also deaf, is a DJ, if you can believe, has an amazing, brilliant professional setup that's like something like 2,000 watts. It's absolutely insane. But on Dancing with the Stars, I couldn't feel anything like what he can in the DJ booth. But, you know, there was a moment, certainly, where we had a couple of NFL uh, dancers who came on, which was really great. And the funny thing was they couldn't catch their footwork right? They just couldn't get the timing right. And at the end, I couldn't hear any of it. I couldn't feel any of it. And I was still able to keep the math perfectly on time, which is kind of ironic, right? I'm the only one in the room who can't hear, and yet I match it. <laughs> yeah, well, congratulations belatedly for, for that, because it was obviously a, a huge success as well. But I suppose what's been driving your work uh, as well to this point, because you've been working now as a producer as well, Oscar nominated, congratulations for Audible. On, on Netflix. Thank you very I much. I mean, that must have been quite the night, especially because of Coda as well, winning. Oh, it was incredible. It was incredible. And truly a watershed moment for our community. If you consider that it's been 35 years since we've had another member of the deaf community take to the Oscar stage, it's really incredible. Marley Matlin's work in this industry, I mean, really truly speaks for itself, but that night we had over 10 deaf people on the red carpet. It was incredible to see that amount of representation and the wins that night. I mean, if you consider three wins alone from Coda was really groundbreaking. And I think it shows that the time is now. It really feels that people, it really feels like people at home are really hungry for our stories. And we're really looking to make this a movement rather than a moment. I think right now we have to start bringing deaf people in behind the camera, right? Which is so key to authenticity because that truly is where it begins. Yes, although the Oscars this year also bring to mind something else. I, I was wondering, did you did you see the slap? We're talking about Will Smith, of course, here. Oh, I did, in fact, see it all. I mean, I think everyone in the audience was quite confused initially. It seemed like a joke or like a scripted bit, but no. Soon as Will Smith started screaming, my interpreter let me know, and everybody went quiet, and I thought, what are you doing stealing our spotlight? Come on, Will. Yeah, I was going to say, that must have been, I mean, were you actually annoyed about that? Was anyone frustrated in the, the deaf community? Because it really was the thing. Yeah, certainly. It was, yeah, it was, my, it was my first thought. I felt like, you know, this is such a historic moment and it really felt like a moment for us. And I thought, at least let us have this one night. But, you know, it's very typical for hearing people to want to set on themselves and ask <laughs> us to just orbit them. <laughs> Yeah, although I'm also now trying to imagine your interpreter um, telling you what Will Smith was saying and you getting that uh, as well, because if you could hear it and see it, it was, as you said, you didn't believe it. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So during the Oscars, they had two large TV screens on both sides. And so I was able to see Will because they had panned over to him. And I could clearly see a reaction of what was going on. But when I asked my interpreter what he was saying, it became very evident that it was not a scripted bit at all. Yeah. And you definitely didn't need to be able to hear to, to understand the last bit, right? Talking about body language. 
<laughs> right. Definitely. Definitely. Immediately. And I could lip read them on the on the cameras as well. It was loud, clear as that. It was, yeah. Well, quite the moment. But as you say, quite the moment for the deaf community as well that night. And um, I know that you also feel very passionately, you say about people behind the camera, but also on the camera. You are of the view that deaf actors should be playing the, the deaf roles. Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I don't think that... Uh, deaf people only ever have to play deaf roles, certainly. But I think that auditions should be open to everyone, including members of our community. And I think we're at a point where we shouldn't be hiring hearing people to play a deaf role, certainly. So many people, I think, assume that it's easy to take on the role of a deaf person. But can they actually really go in there and kill the audition? I don't think so, right? Oftentimes, people are learning sign language a few minutes ahead of time. And, you know, Sign language takes years and years and years to be able to really become fluent in, but also there's a cultural nuance that's really ingrained in us that I think really shows on screen. I had a son a few years ago and we went to a baby sign class. And the reason the woman had started the class was because her sister was deaf. So she had signed her whole life and it was an amazing way to communicate with your child. And, and, and you know, we, we are not deaf, but I greatly enjoyed the class. It's fantastic. A lot of people I don't think really realize that we have a lot of apps available, right? We have the ASL app, which I was thrilled to work on, that provides sign language, right? That can teach you a little bit, not only about our language, but also culture. Technology really is amazing. It really is. Just talking about children, um, there is someone you quote in the book uh, about this whole area around uh, generations and the way that, that, that this is or shouldn't be talked about and has been in the past. You quote the view of the man who patented in the first telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, who despite marrying a deaf woman, didn't believe deaf people should marry each other because of the risk of deaf children. Why did you include that in the book? I included it, I think, because it's important for hearing people to read and really understand that deaf issues are not new. Right? that language deprivation did not arrive recently. But this has been centuries and centuries of oppression and deprivation. You know, in my book, I really work to outline the events sort of of our history and bring those to modern day, which I think a lot of people don't realize. But of course, what he was saying, you know, as, as horrible and unpalatable as it is to hear, or to say, I should say, certainly in this, was a lot of the, the people's view at the time and may continue to be. And I just wondered, as your fourth generation uh, within a family like that, you know, what, what is your message on that point? And, and also, how has it made you think about your future? I would say, to be honest with you, I, I would be open to marrying a deaf or a hearing person, right? You know, I think what's really important is sort of that connection. But, you know, I think we should all trust our kids and certainly ourselves to know that when we fall in love, it's it's right, you know? I don't think that we should certainly, you know, I mean, love is not expensive, right? But it's, you know, available to all of us, I think. I mean, I suppose that the other question there is around is around children. I mean, you may not have got that far, and I'm not meaning to pry, um, but but when you think about, uh, if if you think about such things, do, do you ever think about their, like their lives and how you would want their lives to be uh, with your own experiences and with your siblings? So I'll tell you, you know, a big part of deaf culture is that we want to be able to pass it on like any of our cultures, right? We want to be able to give our children that sense of community. You know, I would, I would love to have a deaf child, but, you know, I think I would really want my children to know the culture, to know the community, to share our language, right? That beautiful world that I was lucky enough to grow up in, I would, of course, want to pass that on. And I would want them to carry that same torch. I recognize this is a strange question because I, I, I'm not comparing the two, but I sometimes, I'm an only child, I get asked, would you have liked siblings? And how was that as if it was awful? But it's the only thing I know. So I can only say, I'm okay. It was great. You know, I, 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 I was okay. But I was going to ask you, because I think people are curious about this, do, do you think that it is a better way to live without hearing? Because you seem to have got so much from your culture. I, I typically tell people, I truly don't know any different, much like you, right? I grew up entirely deaf, and so I don't really have a, a concept of, of sound or silence. I mean, I can't hear waves, but I think they're really beautiful. And so I think our interpretations are just a little bit different, and our experience of those are different. But 
I can tell you, you know, I, of course, would love to meet and work with even more deaf people who want to come to the dark side, I guess. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. Have you ever, I don't know if, you, if it is possible for you, have you ever been interested in trying any of the technology to help you hear? Well, funny enough, a lot of people don't know, I actually used hearing aids growing up, but I hated them. Not going to lie. I absolutely loathed them. The sound used to give me the worst headaches. And my brother, who's deaf, loves DJing, right? In his car, he's got an insane sound system. He will crank it so loud to the point where your entire body is shaking. And within five, 10 minutes, I'm like, bro, 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 you got to cut it out. <laughs> because it's so unfamiliar to me that I seriously, I end up with a migraine. So, but that's just me personally. There's a lot of deaf people out there who I think can relate to it and might not be able to. How interesting. I, I had no idea that, that that they could give you a headache, you know, in the bid to, to help you hear. Yep. <laughs> that's just, I guess, how my hearing works. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, there are those videos, you will have seen them of a child hearing for the very first time. Uh, and, you know, I suppose, there is that narrative that then goes along with those sorts of videos about that being a miracle and that being the goal. I think a lot of people out there are very misinformed on the experience of deaf people, right? People love those videos. They love them. They're supposed to feel great, but it's a few seconds of another human's life if you consider it, right? You know, when I consider how I go about my day and all of the things that are required for a baby to be able to hear for the first time, those two things are very different, right? What's important is not the ability to hear. What's important is the access to language, right? And those are two very different things. Just because you can hear something like I could with hearing aids doesn't mean that I would have access to language, right? Of course, it's cute. But I always want to ask people, okay, you have this child who's now have who's now had a hearing aid or a cochlear put in. What sort of resources are you going to provide them for the long term? Is there a, a phrase or a word that you think is far better in sign than spoken? Oh, any phrase or words. Um, oh, I'd have to think about that. <laughs> I'd have to. Th mm. Oh, you know what? I have to say it. My favorite sign is monster. It always has been. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think it looks really cool. You know, it means so many things, but it's also slang in the deaf community. You know, it means like dope or like good job, right? We'll say like, ah, uh, monster. I love it. It's Wait, can, can, can we, can we <laughs> say it again? Yeah, yeah, monster. Okay, great. It's good. This is, a, this, is, this is a lesson. I always, I love knowing what people's favorite phrases and words are. So why not ask about sign, right? Right, no, definitely. And you know, monster is like a, it's like a generational slang. So it's been around, you know, the, let's say maybe, you know, young kids, older kids, maybe they won't know exactly, but for, you know, my age group, they all know, like, that's our thing. That's like our, you know, I don't know, it's a millennial thing. We all kind of made it up. Niall, I feel, I feel I've been welcomed in to the crew, the monster crew briefly. It's lovely to talk to you. And, um, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. And I've had a great time with you. I hope to do this again. <laughs> that would be great. And thank you, I should say, for being with us. Until we meet again, take care and goodbye.